My name is Nika Spaulding, and I'm the Director of Women's Equipping and Curriculum here at Watermark Community Church. And uh, when most people hear that, they go, okay, cool, great, what is it that you do at Watermark exactly? And so when you think of most women's Bible studies and things like that, that's mostly what my job entails. So we have a Wednesday morning Bible study, a Thursday night Bible study that I teach at. Um, and then we also have other theology classes that I help run or teach at. And then the curriculum piece of my title is that we write a new and unique curriculum every year for the women's Bible studies. And so I lead that effort as well. So, uh, creating curriculum, we start with literally a blank piece of page. And we step back and say, okay, what is it? What's the book of the Bible? What's the topic that we feel like would most benefit our women to learn next year? Um, we typically balance from Old Testament to New Testament, so this year we're doing Exodus, and so for next year we'll be doing the book of Acts, which is New Testament. And so what we start with is just going, what is the big idea that everybody for the last 2,000 years has said is the big idea of Acts? And so for us, we're saying that's how the church came to be. And so we start with that. We start with this big idea, and then we begin to break it down chapter by chapter and idea by idea. As we read through the book of Acts, we look at different theological topics. So we say, hey, baptism is a big deal. Um, tithing is a big deal. Church discipline is a big deal. Sharing the gospel is a big deal. And so we make sure all of those big deals, so to speak, make it into our curriculum every year and so that our women are able to discuss and learn and talk about these things that people for, frankly, 2,000 years have all said are big ideas in the book of Acts. So I think the, the thing that each new generation has a problem with doing is thinking they're unique and unlike those before them. Um, so many times we have this modern arrogance that just says because of the technology that we have somehow we're better or different than the generations before us. But at the, at the heart of every humanity is a desire to be known, a desire to be loved, a desire to be a part of something bigger than themselves. Studying things like Acts, studying things like the Bible allows people to understand that they're they are taking part in something that's bigger than them. A movement that started 2,000 years ago that have people in it that died for what they believe, died for this cause that's so much bigger. And so what we're really doing is inviting people to take part in something that transcends even this generation and will transcend the next generation. And so. What we find is, as Scripture tells us, there's nothing new under the sun. It's what Ecclesiastes tells us, and we learn that every year. You know, as we learn Exodus this year, we talk about that in Exodus there's a God who rescues, there's a God who redeems, and God who reveals Himself. And the crazy thing is, is we all today need rescuing, redemption, and a God who reveals Himself. And so, whether you're studying a book that's 2,000 years old or something that was written 20 years ago, when it talks about things that are timeless truths, it becomes valuable for anybody reading it. So that's a great question. Why is the Bible valuable? Why is the Bible different as a historical and religious book? Uh, one of the things that makes the Bible unique is that it's not only a religious book, but it's a historical book. And what I mean by that is there's dates, there's times, there's events, and all of these things are written in there so people can check them. It's not just us saying, hey, this happened 2,000 years ago, but you can look at history accounts, things Josephus has written, things that are in ancient Near Eastern documents that say that these events that we're talking about actually did happen in time and space. This book is allowing itself to be scrutinized. You know, we firmly believe that if truth is truth, then it'll stand up under any amount of scrutiny. And so when people ask me, well, how do you know? My question is, well, shouldn't you know? Wouldn't you want to test and, and test and test? Because obviously that religion and faith and these ideas are things that quite frankly we're betting our lives on. And even if you're not involved in it, you're betting your life on the fact that it doesn't exist. And so I just tell people, it'll stand up to the scrutiny, dig deep, dive into it, check the things it talks about. And if you find yourself beginning to go, this thing might be trustworthy, well then you might want to know what's inside of it. One of the things that postmoderns love and, and millennials love is this idea of mysticism, this idea of mystery, that we don't have to put everything under a microscope and analyze it. Well, Christianity doesn't hold up well under a microscope, and that was a flaw for the modern movement. It was going, hey, if we can't prove it and see it and taste and feel, and, and some of what makes Christianity so appealing is the Holy Spirit and this idea that God moves in and through people in mysterious ways. His scripture says that His ways are not like our ways, they're above ours. And what an incredible thing to subscribe to. You believe in something that you can't fully know and fully understand. What an adventure. And so I, when I think about what millennials bring to the table, this, this idea that we want something bigger than ourselves, I think Christianity offers that. I think it offers an opportunity to be a part of a movement, a part of a, um, you know, one of the things that in the 60s when you saw some of this postmodernism come out, there was this rebellion against the system, against the government, against institutions. And I love that. And so, so many times what people want to do is rebel against the institution of the church and they forget that the church is not brick and mortar, but the church is about people. 
And, and millennials don't want to move away from people, they want to move towards people. And so I say, well, come be a part of this. If you don't want to meet in a brick and mortar building, great, go meet outside, whatever. The weather's been so great, why wouldn't you? And so I think if millennials will, will try the church, they'll find it to be something that, that satisfies this deep longing in them. And I think we can do a better job um, as a church reaching out in those ways and expressing those values that we hold dearly.